So you were never in London before, said Mr. Wemmick to me. No, said I. I was new here once, said Mr. Wemmick. Rum to think of now. You are well acquainted with it now. Why, yes, said Mr. Wemmick. I know the moves of it. Is it a very wicked place? I asked more for the sake of saying something than for information. You may get cheated, robbed, and murdered in London. But there are plenty of people anywhere who'll do that for you. If there is bad blood between you and them, said I to soften it off a little. Oh, I don't know about bad blood, returned Mr. Wemmick. There's not much bad blood about. They'll do it if there's anything to be got by it. That makes it worse. You think so, returned Mr. Wemmick. Much about the same, I should say. He wore his hat on the back of his head and looked straight before him walking in a self-contained way, as if there were nothing in the streets. His mouth was such a post-office of a mouth that he had a mechanical appearance of smiling. We had got to the top of Holborn Hill before I knew that it was merely a mechanical appearance, and that he was not smiling at all. Do you know where Mr. Do you know where Mr. Do you know where Mrs. Matthew Pocket Lives. I asked Mr. Wemmick. Yes, said he, nodding in the direction. At Hammersmith, west of London. Is that far? Well, say five miles. Do you know him? Why, you're a regular cross-examiner, said Mr. Wemmick, looking at me with an approving air. Yes, I know him. I know him. There was an air of toleration or depreciation about his utterance of these words that rather depressed me, and I was still looking sideways at his block of a face in search of any encouraging note. My depression was not alleviated by the announcement, for I had supposed that establishment to be an hotel kept by Mr. Barnard, to which the Blue Boar in our town was a mere public house. Whereas I now found Barnard to be a disembodied spirit, or a fiction, and his in the dingiest collection of shabby buildings ever squeezed together in a rank corner as a club for Tom Cat. We entered this heaven through a wicked gate, and were disgorged by an introductory passage into a melancholy little square that looked to me like a flat burying ground. I thought it had the most dismal trees in it, and the most dismal sparrows, and the most dismal cats, and the most dismal houses in number half a dozen or so that I had ever seen. I thought the windows of the sets of chambers into which those houses were divided were in every stage of dilapidated blind and curtain, crippled flower pot, cracked glass, dusty decay, a frozy morning of soot and smoke attired this forlorn creation of Barnard, and it had strewn ashes on its head, and was undergoing penance and humiliation as a mere dust hole. Thus far my sense of sight. While dry rot and wet rot, and all the silent rots that rot in neglected roof and cellar, rot of rat and mouse and bug and coaching stables, Wemmick, a uh, said he, mistaking me, the retirement reminds you of the country. So it does me. He led me into a corner and conducted me up a flight of stairs, which appeared to me to be slowly collapsing into sawdust, so that one of those days the upper lodger, Mr. Pocket, John, was painted on the door, and there was a label on the letter box, returned shortly. He hardly thought you'd come so soon, Mr. Wemmick explained. You don't want me any more? No, thank you, said I. As I keep the cash, Mr. Wemmick observed, we shall most likely meet pretty often. Good day. Good day. I put out my hand, and Mr. Wemmick at first looked at it as if he thought I wanted something. Then he looked at me and said, correcting himself, to be sure, yes, you re in the habit of shaking hands. I was rather confused, thinking it must be out of the London fashion, but said yes. I have got so out of it, said Mr. Wemmick, 
except at last. Very glad, I'm sure, to make your acquaintance. Good day, when we had shaken hands and he was gone, I opened the staircase window and had nearly beheaded myself, for the lines had rotted away, and it came down like, happily it was so quick that I had not put my head out. After this escape, I was content to take a foggy view of the inn through the windows encrusting dirt, and to stand dolefully looking out, saying to myself that London was decidedly overrated. Mr. Pocket, Jr.'s idea of shortly was not mine, for I had nearly maddened myself with looking out for half an hour, and had written my name with my finger several times in the dirt of Gradually there rose before me the hat, head, neckcloth, waistcoat, trousers, boots, of a member of society of about my own standing. He had a paper bag under each arm and a pottle of strawberries in one hand, and was out of brief. Mr. Pip, said he. Mr. Pocket, said I. Dear me, he exclaimed. I am extremely sorry, but I knew there was a coach from your part of the country at midday, and I thought you would come by that one. The fact is I have been out on your account, not that that is any excuse, for I thought, coming from the country, you might like a little fruit after dinner, and I went to Covent Garden Mark. I acknowledged his attention incurrently, and began to think this was a dream. Dear me, said Mr. Pocket, Jr., this door sticks so. As he was fast making jam of his fruit by wrestling with the door while the paper bags were under his arms, I begged him to allow me to hold them. He relinquished them with an agreeable smile, and combated with the door as if it were a wild beast. It yielded so suddenly at last, that he staggered back upon me, and I staggered back upon the opposite door, and we both laughed. But still I felt as if my eyes must start out of my head, and as if this must be a dream. Pray come in, said Mr. Pocket, Jr. Allow me to lead the way. I am rather bare here, but I hope you will be able to make out tolerably well till Monday. My father thought you would get on more agreeably through tomorrow with me than with him, and might like to take a walk about London. I am sure I shall be very happy to show London to you. As to our table, you won't find that that bad, uh, I hope, for it will be supplied from our coffee-house here, and it is only right I should add at your expense, such be Jagger's directions. As to our lodging, it's not by any means splendid, because I have my own bread to earn, and my father hasn't anything to give me, and I shouldn't be willing to take it if he had. This is our sitting room, just such chairs and tables and carpet and so forth, you see, as they could spare from home. You mustn't give me credit for the tablecloth and spoons and casters, because they come for you from the coffee house. This is my little bedroom, rather musty, but Barnard's is musty. This is your bedroom. The furniture's hired for the occasion, but I trust it will answer the purpose. If you should want anything, I'll go and fetch it. The chambers are retired, and we shall be alone together, but we shan't fight, I dare say. But dear me, I beg your pardon. You were holding the fruit all this time. Pray let me take these bags from you. I am quite ashamed. As I stood opposite to Mr. Pocket, Jr., delivering him the bags, one, two, I saw the starting appearance come into his own eyes that I knew to be in mine. And he said, falling back, Lord bless me, you were the, the pale young gentleman, and I stood contemplating one another in Barnard's Inn, until we both burst out laughing. The idea of its being you, said he. The idea of its being you, said I, and then we contemplated one another afresh, and laughed again. Well, said the pale young gentleman, reaching out his hand good-humouredly, it's all over now. I hope, 
and it will be magnanimous in you if you will forgive me for Herbert Pocket, for Herbert was the pale young gentleman's name, still rather confounded his intention with his execution. But I made a modest reply, and we shook hands warmly. You hadn't come into your good fortune at that time, said Herbert Pocket. No, said I. No, he acquiesced. I heard it had happened very lately. I was rather on the lookout for good fortune then. Indeed, yes. Miss Havisham had sent for me to see if she could take a fancy to me. But she couldn't. At all events, she didn't. I thought it polite to remark that I was surprised to hear that. Bad taste, said Herbert, laughing, but a fact. Yes, she had sent for me on a trial visit, and if I had come out of it successfully, I suppose I should have been provided for. Perhaps I should have been what you may call it to it. He was arranging his fruit in plates while we talked, which divided his attention, and was the cause of his having made this lapse of a word. Affianced, he explained, still busy with the fruit. Betrothed. Engaged. What's his name? Any word of that sort. How did you bear your disappointment? I asked. Pooh, said he, I didn't care much for it. She's a tartar, Miss Havisham. I don't say no to that, but I meant Estella. That girl's hard and haughty and capricious to the last degree, and has been brought up by Miss Havisham to wreak revenge on all the male sex. What relation is she to Miss Havisham? None. Only adopted. Why should she wreak revenge on all the male sex? What revenge? Lord, Mr. Pip, said he. Don't you know? No, said I. Dear me, it's quite a story, and shall be saved till dinner time. And now let me take the liberty of asking you a question. How did you come there that day? I told him, and he was attentive until I had finished, and then burst out laughing again, and asked me if I was sore afterwards. I didn't ask him if... Mr. Jaggers is your guardian. I understand. He went on. Yes. You know he is Miss Havisham's man of business and solicitor, and has her confidence when nobody else has. This was bringing me, I felt, towards danger. I answered with a constraint I made no attempt to disguise that I had seen Mr. Jaggers in Miss Havisham's house on the very day of our combat, but never at any other time, and that I believed he had no recollection of having ever seen me there. He was so obliging as to suggest my father for your tutor, and he called on my father to propose it. Of course he knew about my father from his connection with Miss Havisham. My father is Miss Havisham's cousin. Not that that implies familiar intercourse between them, for he is a bad courtier and will not propitiate her. Herbert Pocket had a friend. I had never seen any one then, and I have never seen any one since, who more strongly expressed to me, in every look and tone, a natural incapacity to do anything. There was something wonderfully hopeful about his general air and something that at the same time whispered to me he would never be very successful or rich. I don't know how this was. I became imbued with the notion on that first occasion before we sat down to dinner, but I cannot define by what means. He was still a pale young gentleman, and had a certain concord languor about him in the midst of his spirits and briskness that did not seem indicative of natural strength. He had not a handsome face, but it was better than handsome being extremely amiable and cheerful. His figure was a little ungainly, as in the days when my knuckles had taken such liberties with it, but it looked as if it would always be light and young. Whether Mr. 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 Trab's local work would have sat more gracefully on him than on me may be a question but I am conscious that he carried off his rather old clothes much better than I carried off my new suit. As he was so communicative, I felt that reserve on my part would be a bad return unsuited to our years. 
I therefore told him my small story, and laid stress on my being forbidden to inquire who my benefactor was. I further mentioned that as I had been brought up a blacksmith in a country place, and knew very little of the ways of politeness, I would take it as a great kindness in him if he would give me a hint whenever he saw me at a with pleasure, said he, though I venture to prophesy that you will want very few hints. I dare say we shall be often together, and I should like to banish any needless restraint between us. Will you do me the favor to begin at once to call me by my Christian name, Herbert? I thanked him and said I would. I informed him in exchange that my Christian name was Philip. I don't take to Philip, said he, smiling, for it sounds like a moral boy out of the spelling book, who was so lazy that he fell into a pond, or so fat that he couldn't see out of his eye. I tell you what I should like. We are so harmonious, and you have been a blacksmith. Would you mind it? I shouldn't mind anything that you propose. I answered, but I don't understand you. Would you It was a nice little dinner. Seemed to me then a very Lord Mayor's feast, and it acquired additional relish from being eaten under those independent circumstances, with no old people by. This again was heightened by a certain gypsy character that set the banquet off, for while the table was, as Mr. Pumblecook might have said, the lap of luxury, being entirely furnished forth from the coffee-house, the circumjacent region of sitting-room was of a comparatively pastureless and shifty. All this made the feast delightful, and when the waiter was not there to watch me, my pleasure was without alloy. We had made some progress in the dinner, when I reminded Herbert of his promise to tell me about Miss Havisham. True, he replied. I'll redeem it at once. Let me introduce the topic, Handel by mentioning that in London it is not the custom to put the knife in the mouth, for fear of accidents, and that while the fork is reserved for that use, it is scarcely worth mentioning, only it's as well to do as other people do. Also, the spoon is not generally used overhand, but under. This has two advantages. You get at your mouth better, which after all is the object, and you save a good deal of the attitude of opening oysters on the part of the right elbow. He offered these friendly suggestions. Now, he pursued, concerning Miss Havisham. Miss Havisham, you must know, was a spoiled child. Her mother died when she was a baby, and her father denied her nothing. Her father was a country gentleman down in your part of the world, and was a brewer. I don't know why it should be a crack thing to be a brewer, but it is indisputable that while you cannot possibly be genteel and bake, you may be as genteel as never was in brew. You see it every day. Yet a gentleman may not keep a public house. May he, said I, not on any account, returned Herbert. But a public house may keep a gentleman. Well, Mr. Havisham was very rich and very proud. So was his daughter. Miss Havisham was an only child, I hazarded. Stop a moment. I am coming to that. No, she was not an only child. She had a half-brother. Her father privately married again his cook, I rather think. I thought he was proud, said I. My good handle, so he was. He married his second wife privately because he was proud, and in course of time she died. When she was dead, I apprehend he first told his daughter what he had done and then the son became a part of the family, residing in the house you are acquainted with. As the son grew a young man, he turned out riotous, extravagant, undutiful, altogether bad. At last his father disinherited him, but he softened when he was dying, and left him well off, though not nearly so well off as Miss Havisham. Take another glass of wine. I thanked him and apologized. He said, not at all, and resumed. Miss Havisham was now in Harris, and you may suppose was looked after as a great match. Her half-brother had now ample means again, but what with debts and what with new madness wasted them most fearfully again. There were stronger differences between him and her than there had been between him and his father, and it is suspected that he cherished a deep and mortal grudge against her as having influenced the father's anger. Now, I come to the cruel part of the story, 
merely breaking off my dear handle to remark that a dinner napkin will not go into a tumbler why i was trying to pack mine i only know that i found myself with a perseverance worthy of a much better cause making the most strenuous exertions to compress it within those limits again i thanked him and apologized and again he said in the cheerfulest manner not at all i am sure and resumed there appeared upon the scene say at the races or the public balls or anywhere else you like a certain man who made love to miss havisham i never saw him for this happened five and twenty years ago before you and i were handa but i have heard my father mention that he was a showy man and the kind of man for the purpose but that he was not to be without ignorance or prejudice mistaken for a gentleman my father most strongly asseverates because it is a principle of his that no man who was not a true he says no varnish can hide the grain of the wood and that the more varnish you put on the more the grain will express itself well this man pursued miss havisham closely and professed to be devoted to her i believe she had not shown much susceptibility up to that time but all the susceptibility she possessed certainly came out then and she passionately loved him there is no doubt that she perfectly idolized him he practised on her affection in that systematic way that he got great sums of money from her and he induced her to buy her brother out of a share in the brewery which had been weakly left him your guardian was not at that time in miss havisham's counsels and she was too haughty and too much in love to be advised by any one her relations were poor and scheming with the exception of my father he was poor enough but not time-serving or jealous the only independent one among them he warned her that she was doing too much for this man and was placing herself too unreservedly in his power she took the first opportunity of angrily ordering my father out of the house in his presence and my father has never seen her since i thought of her having said Matthew, to return to the man and make an end of him. The marriage day was fixed, the wedding dresses were bought, the wedding tour was planned out, the wedding guests were invited. The day came, but not the bridegroom. He wrote her a letter, which she received, I struck in, when she was dressing for her marriage, at twenty minutes to nine. At the hour and minute, said Herbert, nodding, what was in it further than that it most heartlessly broke the marriage off i can't tell you because i don't know when she recovered from a bad illness that she had she laid the whole place waste as you have seen it and she has never since looked upon the light of day is that all the st all i know of it and indeed i only know so much through piecing it out for myself for my father always avoids it and even when Miss Havisham invited me to go there. But I have forgotten one thing. It has been supposed that the man to whom she gave her misplaced confidence acted throughout in concert with her half-brother, that it was a conspiracy between them, and that they shared the profits. He may have been married already, and her cruel mortification may have been a part of her half-brother's scheme, said Herbert. Mind, I don't know that. What became of the two men? I asked, after again considering the subject. They fell into deeper shame and degradation, if there can be deeper and ruin. Are they alive now? I don't know. You said just now that Estella was not related to Miss Havisham, but adopted. When adopted, Herbert shrugged his shoulders. There has always been an Estella, since I have heard of a Miss Havisham. I know no more. And now, Handel said he finally throwing off the story as it were there is a perfectly open understanding between us all that i know about miss havisham you know and all that i know i retorted you know i fully believe it so there can be no competition or perplexity between you and me and as to the condition on which you hold your advancement in life namely that you are not to inquire or discuss to whom you owe it you may be very sure that it will never be encroached upon yet he said it with so much meaning too that i felt he as perfectly understood miss havisham to be my benefactress as i understood the fact myself it had not occurred to me before 
that he had led up to the theme for the purpose of clearing it out of our way but we were so much the lighter and easier for having broached it that i now perceived that we were very gay and sociable and i asked him in the course of conversation what he was he replied a capitalist an insurer of ships but again there came upon me for my relief that odd impression that herbert pocket would never be very successful or rich i shall not rest satisfied with merely employing my capital in insuring ships i shall buy up some good life assurance shares and cut into the direction i shall also do a little in the mining way none of these things will interfere with my chartering a few thousand tons on my own account i think i shall trade said he leaning back in his chair to the east indies for silks shawls spices dyes drugs and precious woods it's an interesting trade and the profits are large said i tremendous said he i wavered again and began to think here were greater expectations than my own illustration i think i shall trade also said he putting his thumbs in his waistcoat pockets to the west indies for sugar tobacco and rum also to ceylon especially for elephants tusks you will want a good many ships said i a perfect fleet said he quite overpowered by the magnificence of these transactions i asked him where the ships he insured mostly traded to at present i haven't begun insuring yet he replied i am looking about me somehow that pursuit seemed more in keeping with barnard's inn i said in a tone of conviction ah ha ha yes i am in a counting house and looking about me is a counting house profitable i asked to do you mean to the young fellow who's in it he asked in reply yes to you why no not to me he said this with the air of one carefully reckoning up and striking a balance not directly profitable that is it doesn't pay me anything and i have to keep myself this certainly had not a profitable appearance and i shook my head as if i would imply that it would be difficult to lay by much accumulation but the thing is said herbert pocket that you look about you that's the grand thing you are in a counting house you know and you look about you it struck me as a singular implication that you couldn't be out of a counting house you know and look about you but i silent then the time comes said herbert when you see your opening and you go in and you swoop upon it and you make your capital and then there you are when you have once made your capital you have nothing to do but employ it s was very like his manner of bearing his poverty too exactly corresponded to his manner of bearing that defeat it seemed to me that he took all blows and buffets now with just the same air as he had taken mine then it was evident that he had nothing around him but the simplest necessaries for everything that i remarked upon turned out to have been sent in on my account from the coffee-house or somewhere else yet having already made his fortune in his own mind he was so unassuming with it that i felt quite grateful to him for not being puffed up it was a pleasant addition to his naturally pleasant ways and we got on famously in the evening we went out for a walk in the streets and went half price to the theatre and next day we went to church at westminster abbey and in the afternoon we walked in the parks on a moderate computation it was many months that sunday since i had left joe and biddy the space interposed between myself and them partook of that expansion and our marshes were any distance off that i could have been at our old church in my old church-going clothes on the very last sunday that ever was seemed a combination of impossibilities geographical and social yet in the london streets so crowded with people and so brilliantly lighted in the dusk of evening there were depressing hints of reproaches for that i had put the poor old kitchen at home so far away on the monday morning at a quarter before nine herbert went to the counting-house to report himself to look about him too i suppose and i bore him company he was to come away in an hour or two to attend me to hammersmith and i was to wait about for him 
It appeared to me that the eggs from which young insurers were hatched were incubated in dust and heat, like the eggs of ostriches, judging from the places to which those incipient giants repaired on a Monday